Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Evening Jones. I think if you look down there, it'll say my name. Yeah, that's how I got it going right now. Anyway, if you're watching at TheEveningJones.com, what I need you to do is log in. Use a Twitter profile, Facebook profile, whatever kind of profile it is. Go ahead and use it. Once you do that, you can participate in our chat room. You can also send in your questions. You can type them out, put them on the screen the old-fashioned way, or if you got a webcam and headphones like I got a webcam and headphones, we can go ahead and do this. Now, if you are watching the video, um, someone has said, I have a new microphone. No, this is the microphone that I've used for a little while. Um, I actually just got around after owning this microphone for years to like looking up what all these settings are and like what all this means and where I should sh like put the gain and stuff like that. Like I, I oh, I can see it in the reflection. Okay, yeah, I can. Yeah, there we go. Uh, anyway, I, I ain't really do any of that stuff, man. We just be out here getting it. And so I had something. I, was, I do these sports center hits in here, and everybody thinks that this is my closet, but in reality, this is my office. Like there's a desk. I'm not sitting here Indian style. Like that would be preposterous. Um. Anyway, so I was like, okay, let me try to cut down on the echo because people tell me I echo when I'm on that show. So I'm like, yo, let me cut down on the echo, right? So I started messing with the settings and stuff like that, and I try to keep the mic out the shot for sports center. But it's just me and y'all talking right now. And I figured if the microphone is right there, you know, it makes my life a whole lot easier. I don't have to, like, talk as loud. And on top of it, you know, um, I learned what the settings were for the microphone. And I kind of need to talk it to the front of the microphone. So I got the front of the microphone a little bit closer. Uh, it appears you guys are saying that the sound is better. I had just honestly been so concerned with having the microphone out of the shot for aesthetic purposes. But, I mean... It's not like I'm here doing a great big old production. Like, all that's behind me is shoes and Emmy. Say hi to Emmy. There she is right there. Hey, Emmy. Anyway, uh, you guys seem to appreciate uh, the difference in sound. So, anyway, uh, here we are. Um, I guess it's been a while since we talked. A lot of things have happened. Like, I will say this before I actually get into your questions. I, I have kind of reached a point in this where, like, I got the Apple News app on my phone, right? And it just drops down headlines. And I pick up the phone on the lock screen, bro, and I don't really have any idea what in the world is going to be there. Like, it's a little bit disturbing. Like, I've seriously considered just disabling that. Like, I kind of like, you know, finding out what's going on. But, bruh, it is something day after day after day. Like, there, there is no day after day after day. Yes, I understand the record had to skip right there. But, I mean, I, A, kind of forgot what I was going to talk about. But aside from that, you get the point. Like, it's something every day, yo. Like, this is wild, right? I, I, but I want to make a point, and I think it's a very important point, just something to consider, because I know some people are going to ask about more of these things at some point, whatever. But I just want to say this in the beginning, and then we'll go from here, because I do feel like I'm 36 years old, right? Like, I'm getting to the point where I'm not old, but, like, I'm old enough to not really understand what the kids are doing, right? I am also not someone who spent his entire childhood native to the internet. Like, you know, we get dial up when I'm a teenager, which like if you was going through the home telephone line, which I feel like is something that the youth don't really understand, you know, you can't just be tied up your mama's line on the internet all day long. And so since you can't tie up your mama's line on the internet, there's but so much time that could be spent on said internet and you didn't have access to like your own personal internet portal. Like that's the thing about the phone and everything else is everybody's got their own portal to the internet. Like it was much more of a, like there's a family computer if you had a family computer because computers in the home were not rare, but they weren't just an expectation. Um, anyway, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on with the kids that I do not understand. And I do realize that being native to the internet is part of it. Now, I see quite a few arguments of people who wind up trashing the millennials, right? And I've said this, that at this point, I don't even think that people know what millennial means. Like, they call everybody a millennial now. Like, from where the age breakdowns are that I've seen on millennials, like, people have been talking about them for so long that you're grouping people who are, like, maybe 28 years old with people who are 14, 
And that's not the same, you know, like it just isn't. But that's just like millennial has just become such a broad term that it almost ceases to have meaning. Anyway, everybody likes to talk about how everything's reality show to millennials. Like I work in sports. We did national signing day today. And, you know, you do that and all the kids have their own little show when they got the presentation and everything else. And everybody talks about how uh, it's a real. everything's a reality show to these kids. Everything's a reality show to these kids. Okay, this thing that they did with the Supreme Court justices where they had the two cats who were basically like contestants where they had the same Twitter profile and everything else. Um, That's for a Supreme Court nominee. Donald Trump is 70 years old and millennials are not his audience. Yet and still the reality shows the way that they went about trying to do this. I'm just telling you that it's very easy to point the finger at the millennials of, about having an affinity for this sort of spectacle. But, I mean, this spectacle didn't come about because millennials liked it. It came about because adults liked it, right? Like the advertisers on these shows were trying to reach adults, and they've been doing this for quite a while now. Why? Because people, like, across the age spectrum were into that kind of stuff. Like, I mean, a little bit of everybody is caught up in that matrix. Like, that's just what it is now. I just just think that's something very important to keep in mind as we go and we blame the youth for everything. The grownups are getting down a whole lot like the youth in a whole lot of similar ways. Anyway, let us go to your question. Well, that's a lot of very interesting questions today. Although this one dude asked about this James Brown song about 15 times. Hey, Lance, can you uh, clear out some of those, uh, those, uh, the James Brown question? My man asked it about 17 times. I'm almost scared to, uh, go up. All right, here we go. When's Frederick Douglass next book coming out? So, um, I'm not sure how many of you guys saw this, but Donald Trump did his um, Black History Month thing today. And I have to say that I was not entirely sure that this would be something that would be on their agenda, given some of the people who get to make decisions um, in this administration. And so I was like, okay, they're doing something for Black History. I guess that's good to know. Um, I also was not going to make any attempt uh, whatsoever to actually watch this because I couldn't see any way that this would turn out positively. Um, And so I see Trump's quote about Frederick Douglass. And I want to go find Trump's quote on Frederick Douglass and read it to you word for word because I don't want anybody to feel like I'm misrepresenting what the man said. And, 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 I, and, I, and I think that this is very important because it's going to be very easy to broad brush Donald Trump. Um, it's going to be very, very easy to broad brush him. And so I want to make sure that you understand that if I'm talking about him, that what I'm saying is actually like legitimately 100% what he said. We don't need any confusion. Now, wow, I thought I had this on the timeline. Oh, no, I did. Hold on. I'm sorry, guys. I tried to do this on the fly. Here we go. Trump just described Frederick Douglass as, quote, someone who has done a terrific job that is being recognized by more and more people. And I read that has done a terrific job. And, I mean, I couldn't help but ask or wonder, does he know that Frederick Douglass is dead? Because he said that in a way that almost implied that Frederick Douglass was going to do more work, right? And so here is what Spicer says. Someone asked uh, Sean Spicer, today Trump made the comment about Frederick Douglass being recognized more and more. Do you have any idea what specifically he was referring to? And Spicer's response was, well, I think there was contributions. 
I think he wants to highlight the contributions that he has made. And I think through a lot of the actions and statements that he is going to make, I think the contributions of Frederick Douglass will become more and more. And I don't see how you can honestly read that and not believe that Sean Spicer believes that Frederick Douglass is still alive. I mean, you, you heard it. All right. I read it to you word for word. There appears to be reason to believe that Donald Trump and Sean Spicer think Frederick Douglass is alive. Now, I would like to start by making a point that I am not a Frederick Douglass scholar. I readily acknowledge that Frederick Douglass is one of those dudes that I know a few factoids about, but I'm not like... Frederick Douglass, I do not count Frederick Douglass as one of my heroes, and it has nothing to do with Frederick Douglass. It has a lot more to do with what is basically my lack of information. I do know that he was the United States ambassador to Haiti at one point, which means that he must have been like the black dude, because they're like, yo, we got to find a black dude to send out there to talk to them cats in Haiti. And so, you know, Frederick Douglass, like, I haven't read the stuff, right? So I'm not going to sit here and be like, how dare them? not knowing anything about Frederick Douglass, okay? Like, I don't know that much about Frederick Douglass, and I don't want to purport to be more knowledgeable than I actually am. But what I do know about Frederick Douglass is that he's dead. Like, I I woke up this morning 100% positive that Frederick Douglass was dead. Like, I got that one going for me. I have that one going for me. I knew Frederick Douglass was dead. I am not convinced that Donald Trump and Sean Spicer know that Frederick Douglass is dead. I honestly have no idea what they know about Frederick Douglass. Um, My only guess, and this is how I think this happened. My guess is that somebody looked up something like black Republicans, right? Because I see as a right wing talking point very often is the idea that Frederick Douglass was a Republican, which, I mean, yeah, that is possible, but we're really talking about a completely um, different era. And so, like, I put in Frederick Douglass Republican in Google right now, and there is a website for the Frederick Douglass Republicans. It's frederickdouglassrepublican.com. Um yeah. Yeah, you understand what I'm saying? And so that's the only guess that I have as to how they decided they were going to include Frederick Douglass in this. But what I find interesting is that apparently no one had it in them to ask. So wait, who's this Frederick Douglass? Like, tell me a little bit more about him. They just threw Frederick Douglass' name in there. They, they just threw it in. I, keeping in mind or assuming that this is going to go for at least four years, that means that we are going to have three more of these, right? So if we have three more of these, who else is going to wind up making this rundown over the years? So in 2018, when he's talking about George Washington Carver, will anyone explain to him that uh, George Washington Carver is no longer with us? Or, 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 or will we get, and you have to admit, this could be very good and this could be entertaining and it would make your life better. Donald Trump going on and on about how great peanut butter is while discussing George Washington Carver. By the way, of all the things that George Washington Carver invented, I do not believe he invented peanut butter. I'm looking this up right now. Yes, he did not invent peanut butter. I think a lot of people give George Washington Carver a lot of credit for inventing peanut butter, and he did not. Apparently, he did everything else with the peanut. Um... And I don't want to downplay George Washington Carver's contributions to the world, especially not today, um, the first day of Black History Month. I 
I just want to know how he decided that it was so damn important, all these things that he did with these peanuts. <laughs> like, we have to acknowledge that we do have kind of some, like, standard bearers of Black History Month, right? Like, the names that come up. And there's some other cats that probably did very similar things to these cats that are at the top of the Black History Month list. But for whatever reason, they didn't wind up making the list. Like, I feel like... Like, like, so like Dr. Charles Drew, for example, Dr. Charles Drew is absolutely should be on the Black History Month list. He did very, very, very important things. But I imagine that there's some doctor who used to see Charles Drew at these medical conventions and was like, man, I'm out here doing the same shit he is, man. Don't nobody give me no props. Black History Month will come around and he'd be salty as hell. Because all that shine that Charles Drew is getting, he's supposed to be getting. Yeah. So I wonder if there's some dude, like George Washington Carver did a lot of work with the peanut. He also did a lot of work with the uh, sweet potato. Yeah. Yeah. He, 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 he was a man of the people, shall we say. Um, but I imagine there's some other cat that was going to the conferences with George Washington Carver. Like, I wish they would name a housing project after me. Oh, yeah, Frederick Douglass. That's how we started on this. I was like, somehow I veered off into George Washington Carver. Yeah, I know Frederick Douglass is dead. I knew that before today. Hey, appreciate the question. Let me see what else we got here. Who thought it was a good idea to get have a Mel Gibson movie about police brutality? Oh, hold on now. I feel like that right there is an inadequate explanation of the movie that you are talking about. I am going to go get me a link to the story in Variety that I saw on this movie, and I'm going to let you stop and take a moment and appreciate the fact that apparently someone greenlit this. Oh, that's right. I'm looking for the wrong thing. I just like I'm scrolling through my timeline, which as you know, if you follow me on Twitter is like, it's an unwieldy place. Anyway, I don't ever use capital letters because I find the shift key to be inconvenient. And so now I'm trying to go through this and, uh, find this link and of course i can't as i go anyway so basically there's gonna be a movie and it's about police brutality and it stars both both i tell you both mel gibson and vince vaughn now you're probably wondering like wow what kind of movie would those guys do about police brutality right maybe this is like a serpico kind of thing no 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 no. here we go the story says mel gibson and vince vaughn will reteam to star in dragged across concrete a crime thriller about police brutality directed by bone tomahawk filmmaker s craig zoller okay i'm going to skip a little bit because a lot of this is trade stuff but it says here gibson and vaughn will play cops who are suspended when a video of their strong arm tactics gets wide attention. They then descend into the criminal underworld to exact vengeance. Vengeance against whom exactly for what? So, I... I'm a little uncomfortable with what this movie could ultimately become. Gotta say. Now, it appears that Mel Gibson uh, did not write or direct or anything like this. This is very important. 
right? Like, like he does not appear to have a head in the creativity. Also, Mel Gibson, back in the league. I did not think that Mel Gibson was ever going to make it back to the league. Uh, Mel Gibson has made it, like, full-on back to the league. Yeah. And now he's going to be in a movie about police brutality. So once again, it appears, based on what I've read about the plot of this movie, it appears that these gentlemen get caught for engaging in police brutality and then are suspended, and now they want to go exact vengeance? I'm also curious to know what kind of criminal underworld we're talking about here. Like, who are they strong-arming? I'm worried about that movie, guys. Appreciate the question. Let me see what else we got here. Do you feel the Uber boycott was a little ridiculous, especially with Lyft's connection to Trump? Okay, so, you know, the thing happened at the airport this weekend. And so in New York, the the taxi union decided that they were not going to pick people up from JFK. Um, But Uber, being the predatory capitalist that they are, Uber was like, yo, we'll pick you up, right? And so, of course, uh, people demand a certain morality from their capitalists, which I find to be a bit naive, but whatever. But they're a little down on Uber um, for that. And so people said that they were going to delete Uber. Now, I have to say this, even as someone who was on board with uh, the idea of going to the airport and protesting, If I was at the airport while it was going on, I would greatly appreciate it if I could call an Uber. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, like I feel like we all, I mean, if you were at the airport, you would want to be able to call an Uber, right? Uh, Also, I think Uber was running the surge price. And people get really mad about the surge, but I have no problem with Uber and the surge. Like, I understand part of what the surge does is induce drivers to come out. Now, I've had people tell me that the drivers don't really get that much money off the surge, but all the same. Like, part of it is inducing drivers to come out, right? And so, yeah, I don't have a problem with the surge. I don't. Um I'm also an economics major, so I'm inclined to understand how the force of supply and demand work there. But people boycotted the or the delete Uber or whatever it was. I understood where they were coming from, even if I didn't necessarily think that was the play. I understood it. Um, but then the solution, the, the suggestion was, okay, well, now you go over to Lyft, and then people found out that Lyft had a connection with what, Icon? I-C-A-H-N? I think I'm saying his name right. And he's a Trump supporter. And so here's the thing. I don't know how to break this to you, but there aren't that many ways for good men to make billions of dollars. Right? Like like what you have to do to get billions typically requires you to be down with, you know, <laughs> you're, unless you're going to go straight mom and pop on everything that you do you're not going to be able to keep your money out of the hands of people who offend you. You're just not. So I don't think that was silly of them necessarily to do that with Uber for that reason. Like you can make some arguments for different reasons why it might not have been the best idea, why it probably proved like you could say it would prove to be somewhat ineffective, but not because the competitor has a dude who gets paid who supports Trump. Um, I bet that somebody's got a lot of money in Uber who supports Trump too, even if they ain't telling you. I mean, that's how this goes. Like, look, man, um, say what you want about Trump, but if you're rich, tax game ain't about to be crazy. And the kind of like single-minded sociopathic like, <laughs> outlook that you kind of need to have to get to that level of making money, 
yo, tax game crazy is good enough. They ain't worried about no Muslims. They like tax game crazy. Appreciate the question. Let's see what else we got here. Somebody in here talking about my thoughts on Jason Whitlock's comments about you today. Dude, I don't know what Whitlock said about me. I ain't really going out of my way to find that stuff out. Like, we're not going to turn this into no lunch room, man. I'm not doing that. I think I've demonstrated to you over the course of the last year of change. That's a fight I'm not really engaging in. So, like, you find out something that he said about me, you ain't got to come tell me. I'm really not tripping on it. Hold on, I'm going to find a question, I promise. Bay with three. How do you think this will affect Beyonce's career? So, yeah, uh, I guess I, I saw the day that Beyonce was pregnant. Uh, it's very interesting, by the way. When you're married, you're pregnant. Anybody else, you just got knocked up. Anyway, Beyonce is pregnant with twins apparently is the story. I was unaware of the fact that it was twins and I will wish to them basically what I wish to everyone in a circumstance like this, because I think that any man, if he were having a child with a woman would want this. Otherwise I would say he is a man of low ambition. And I would think that we should all join Jay-Z and Mrs. Carter and hoping that that baby comes out looking like her mama. His or her mama, both of them. Like, if you don't hope that the child you have looks like his mama or her mama, then I feel like you probably settled. Anyway, how will this affect Beyonce's career? Not at all. Beyonce go have them kids is going to go about the way it did the other time. And then next thing you know, she's going to be back out here on this grind in all likelihood. But I mean, Beyonce been somebody mama, right? Like being somebody's mama with more kids isn't such a thing unless you go about it on that Lauren Hill where you're like, yo, this is actually what I'm about to be now. I'm just about to be somebody's mama. All the kids, bro. All the kids. Nah, three. I mean, three ain't that many kids. Right, we know Beyonce is somebody's mama. We good with that. We more than good with that. You know why? Because when you go see Beyonce in concert, she might be somebody's mama, but you don't think about it like that at all. Like I feel like if you look at Beyonce and you think it to yourself, yeah, bro, but she got three kids. Me and you focus on completely different things. Like, like what is background and what is foreground? I mean, I guess for people that just we're not all the same there. You know, we don't all have the same priorities. So you tell me Beyonce got some of them. I'm not really tripping, right? Just hope she leave them at home. I believe I told you about that time I went on a date with a woman. The next thing I knew, she had two coats in her hand and one of them was very little. And I was like, wait, wait a minute. Why you got two jackets? Yeah, it was not a very pleasant viewing of Bruce Almighty. But that's a story for another day. Appreciate the question. Let me see what else we got here. Which reason brought forth the best artists? West Coast, Atlanta, Houston, New York, and Midwest. I'm assuming that this is something that we're um, probably like we're limiting this to rap. 
Because over, I mean, yeah, let's just, I don't want to make that tangential point because then I'm going to get lost talking about something else. Um, I mean, if we're talking about rap, even after all these years, it's hard to argue against New York. Like, I do believe that, see, I think New York had the most heat when rap on the whole was probably at its best, right? Because, I mean, I will acknowledge that when I go back and I listen to older rap, the reality is that being a good rapper was far more important then than it is now. Like, what's important now is whether you can make a dope song. And I'm not, right, you understand what I'm saying? So, like, if the song is dope, it doesn't really matter which way you got there. But there was a previous emphasis on being dope as a rapper that just isn't there in that way anymore, right? Um, and, and it was a different kind of beat. Like, I prefer my beats analog to being digital. I just feel like analog beats feel like something. Digital beats don't really feel like anything. They just don't. So, like, when that was the way that the music went, I think New York was on top of everybody. But it's really hard to argue that in the last 15 years, it just hasn't been about the South. I mean, it's really, really hard. Like with the West Coast, the thing about the West Coast is, if you, especially if you didn't grow up on the West Coast, the West Coast that you did get, that it took to like blow in all these different places, was like the pinnacle of West Coast. It wasn't all N.W.A. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't all too short. Like, I feel like when I start going through West Coast stuff I love, I can't quite go as deep as I can go with other places. The one thing I think the West Coast has always been undersold, although, is a legitimate variety of sound. You know, L.A. had a different sound. Oakland had a different sound. L.A. has sounds within sounds, you know. But, yeah, I mean, I think you got to go New York. I know a lot of y'all think I hate New York, but I grew up, like, I was hardcore, basically. If it wasn't out of New York for the longest, man, I wasn't feeling it. Then I met a whole bunch of dudes from New York, and I wasn't really feeling them. Like, I'm cooler about it now, but, like, at the time, oh, you can call me country. I got your country. Anyway, the South won. Buy a T-shirt. Appreciate the question. Let's see what else we got here. Is it safe to say those who cry out fake news and or journalism is dead or unable to read? So, Here's the thing about this fake news, right? And I'm going to ask you, and I'm saying, don't limit this strictly to the people on your mama's Facebook page or whatever. How many people have you engaged in discussion who actually referred to something as fake news? Because I have yet to have that happen. Right. I, I don't have a single time that I can point to that I've been like in an exchange with somebody that really was like, yo, that's just fake news based on something that they received from a reputable source. Like the discussion of fake news was about actual real life fake news, like news that was created. And now the term has kind of been co opted. And it's been co opted in a way that seemed to be necessary to maintain some sort of tit for tat or some sort of both sides. Because it's like on one hand, we have these pieces of uh, right wing, right wing propaganda that are not true. So then those on the right have to come up with something on the other side that is the same thing. And so any news that comes out, <clears throat> whether it be something that is reported that may ultimately prove to not be true or things change or whatever it is. Now that becomes fake news because there has to be fake news on the other side. Like, some of the stuff that's being called fake news is very much so reminiscent of, like, the claim of reverse racism. You know, so, like, we actually have racism over here. Okay, well, that means we got to have some racism over here. And so we talk about reverse racism. Well, what happened? I never get picked first to play basketball. Okay, yes, they are underestimating your, your great mid-range game. You are correct, but it's, like, it's not really the same thing. But here we are. Here we are. So, like, I hear the thing, like, alternative facts, you know, and all of this stuff. And, like, 
I do believe that there's a certain audacity to saying these things, but I don't know how many people actually believe it. And I'm not saying that there aren't people who believe it. I'm just not sure how many people actually believe it. And so I do kind of feel like that as people kind of parrot this idea and say it over and over again, this idea, this notion of fake news, I think it's less important to get caught up in the idea of fake news than the actual veracity of whatever piece of news is in front of you and then go from there. But it once you start throwing everything together in the fake news, I'm telling you, it's another thing that becomes so unwieldy that it is like the term has already become useless and it's only really been flying around for maybe a couple of months. So just something to consider. Appreciate the question. All the people ask the sports questions. We don't do those here. My contract doesn't allow it. Wow, I say Kamal's having trouble selecting between these questions. They are largely good. How good was the new edition biopic, and what are your top five biopics of all time? Um, I'm in a fairly good mood right now, so I won't respond to this as I ordinarily would, but those of you who have done this with me for a while, I need you guys to sometimes stop and ask yourselves, right? A top five list. A top five is not enough just to ask me my favorite one. You need five of them. Like, don't you think that's a little bit demanding? Top five. Like, do you realize that if I wanted to do, like, a list of top five biopics of all time and I wanted to write it, that I could go get somebody to pay me a few hundred dollars to do that, and you want it for free. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, that, 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 that's going a little bit too far. Just a little bit too far. I know you meant no harm. I just want you to think about it. People hit me with that a lot. Well, what, what, who, who do you think are the five best shooting guards of all time in the history of the Big Ten? I, damn, really? Like, I don't really have the memory at this point that requires me to do the kind of recall that you request. That being said, the new edition biopic, I actually have still not seen the third episode. I saw the first two episodes. I was surprised by how good it was. It was very, very, very good. And I have to say, I don't watch a lot of BET, but that's primarily because I simply don't watch a lot of television, right? I just, I just don't watch a lot of television. Um, I got to say, man, BET has washed a lot of the stink off. They really have. Like, I do feel like the quality at BET has really gone up from what it was from when I watched BET uh, myself. Um, I also think that part of that becomes required as the music video. They couldn't anchor the network around the music video anymore. So once you can't do that, it really requires that you step up your programming because, like, it is no longer the case that the programming on BET is just to hold you over until they can run some more videos. You know what I mean? Like the programming now at BET is the centerpiece. Like that's the network. That's what they do is they do the program. And I thought the document, I mean, I thought the, 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 the two parts that I saw were really good. And I didn't realize that the kids themselves were doing the singing until they came on. I mean, I, I, I thought it was compelling. I thought the acting was good. I thought it was well-written. Like, I really didn't have anything that I could point to. And God knows, the BET, they normally make it real easy for you to point to shit. I didn't have anything to point to. I thought that that was some of the best work as a network that they have ever done. And it's just so very, very interesting to me that New Edition could be as impactful as they were to black people of that generation and i'm not saying there was no white people on the new edition wagon but 
how did that not like carry over in an enduring way? And, you know, so I mean, and let's be honest about this, right? Like people will be like, well, there's new kids on the block. And yeah, new kids on the block can go out and they can tour and they'll get people to, you know, buy their tickets and stuff like that. But like, let's not pretend like new kids on the block went down as like one of the all time great groups. They were also the object of a great deal of ridicule in a way that new edition never has been because black people had a little bit of a different relationship with their boy bands than white people uh, tend to, I find. Um, but I don't see how it is that New Edition wouldn't reach white people the same exact way. Given that the music, it's not like this is like extra hardcore music. You know what I mean? Like there was nothing to stop you from getting into it. So like, it's just interesting to me that it could be such a big thing with all the black people I knew and white people seem not to care at all. And I would think that there would be more like white New Edition fans. I guess I just didn't see them. I'm not saying they don't exist. I just didn't really come across them. Appreciate the question. Hey, it's gone by kind of fast today. Let me see what else we got here. What do you believe is the solution to America's mass incarceration of people of color? Guys, let's stop and take a moment and appreciate this. Huh? The solution to mass incarceration. Not a solution. Not even a couple of suggestions. The solution to America's mass incarceration of people of color. I mean, the things that y'all think that y'all could get for free. If I had this answer, I'm telling you, as much as I enjoy talking about sports, I find it highly unlikely that's what I would still be doing. So I apologize. I hope I haven't disappointed you. I don't have an answer to that. I'm just not that good. I just don't have it in. You talked on the right time the other day about the racist view people have of African-Americans saying they can only make it out of urban communities by being athletes. What do you think could be done to inspire kids in urban communities to chase more secure and achievable professions? Do you think serious progress can be made in areas like this with Trump as president? Let me tell you, the reason I, brought, I pulled this question up is, man, this whole thing about searching for achievable professions is part of the problem. Uh, and yeah, you do need to be positioned to be, you know, you, you do need to do things that allow you to position yourself in order to make a, a living, right? You, you do need to do that. And so with football, for a lot of people, it's a lottery ticket, basically, because you got a chance to hit it big and it's got a chance, you know, there is a certain aim for the stars, land in the cloud elements that comes from football. But there are a lot of ways to do this, man. There are a lot of ways. And I think that more important than talking about chasing achievable professions is simply developing like broad people with a broad set of interests. And so I did not grow up poor so i'm not in a position to tell people how they should do things as they are poor themselves that being said i do believe that there is a certain amount of access to like stuff like things that are around um you know like you know parks and museums and you know these kinds of things and there is you know libraries there's access to this internet that can get you to things right um, 
there are ways to expose people that don't require this spectacular emphasis that we have on athletics. Now, I do think it requires a greater dedication of resources to these things that we currently have, whether they come from private or public sources. Um, I don't want to pretend as though there are there is enough access to these things, but there is some level of access to these things. So, I mean, I meet the, there. Are, I think that people are under this mistaken impression that like nobody gets out the hood but the football players. And one thing you learn going to a black college is that is simply not true. It's simply not true. Now, are the numbers as good as one might like them to be? No, they are not. But I do think that you don't have to make millions of dollars to get out the hood. Like, that's the thing. You don't have to make millions of dollars to get out the hood. There are other ways to do it. And I do think that we ignore that there are a lot of other people who find ways to do it every day. And you can invest in the ways that those people have managed to get it out just as easily as anybody can invest in something like football or basketball. Those are ways, right? And I think that there's a great value in athletics for simply giving people something to do, right? Like, I think that. At the same time, I do believe that some of those, some of the good things you get out of putting people in athletics would be achieved if they had something else to do. The key is having something to do. I just don't want people thinking the only thing there is to do is play ball. Appreciate the question. Let me see what else we got here. Do you think anyone will ever top Jimi Hendrix as the best guitarist ever? I do think that this is a fairly interesting question, right? Because the thing about Jimi Hendrix is there's been very little dispute as to whether or not Jimi Hendrix is the greatest guitar player of all time, at least in you know the sort of sphere that he's in. Um, and never forget that what we're talking about from the Jimi Hendrix catalog is basically from 1966 to 1969. Like, I mean, it's a very short period of time that we got him. Um, and he was the coldest. And so people are like putting up Prince. Like, Prince is really good, but there's something that Jimi Hendrix has that Prince did not. And Prince plays like a much more pretty style of guitar. It's more in line with Santana than Hendrix. But I don't think that Prince, even in spite of how incredible he is and how like technically perfect he can be and all this stuff, it still ain't Jimmy. It's just not Jimmy. Jimmy's mind was just in a completely different place on guitar. Just totally, right? And so there probably has been someone who's better at playing guitar than Jimi Hendrix. And there certainly will be someone who is better at playing guitar than Jimi Hendrix. But I'm not going to care if those people are better than Jimi Hendrix. I got Jimi at number one, and I'm just like, we're not putting any motion on the agenda to revisit this. That decision's been made by the executive. No. Like, everybody's playing for number two. And I'm fine with that. You know why? Because it doesn't affect anything. It doesn't change anything. I have made the decision to be obstinate on this. Like somebody here talking about Carlos Santana. No, 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 no. Carlos is good. Carlos is good. Carlos ain't no Jimi Hendrix, man. I mean, that's just, <laughs> that's, just, that's just what it is. And it happens like that sometimes. And the thing, the biggest thing with Jimi Hendrix is, and people get lost on this, 
I've seen it. I read this somewhere. It's just like as good as Jimmy was on guitar. The thing to understand is Jimmy might be the greatest studio engineer that ever lived and is probably the greatest studio engineer who ever lived. Now, my man Willie here makes a good point that if Jimmy had, uh, would Jimmy have made his own supernatural if he didn't die? So basically, if Jimmy had lived into the early, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, and somebody offered him the payday of doing an album like Supernatural, would he do it? Here's the thing about Supernatural, though. Supernatural did have a jam or two, right? Like, the smooth joint was cool until everybody decided that it wasn't. But it was jamming for a little while. Like, let's not pretend. Everybody act, act like they don't like smooth. And I admit, when I hear it now, it's like, yeah, I thought it was better when it first came out. We was rock with smooth when it came out. And also, that Supernatural album has Do You Like the Way with CeeLo and Lauren Hill. And that joint is dope. Like, I don't know about anything else, but that Do You Like the Way is dope. Now, would Jimi Hendrix have done that? I don't know, because the thing about Jimmy is Jimmy was such a weirdo. Like, I don't think anybody can have any real idea about where he would have gone at that point. But let us also not forget that as 1970 comes around, Jimmy's playing in the all-black band, and Jimmy, King dying had a real effect on Jimmy, and Jimmy was going in a different direction. Like, what I wonder is, would Jimmy have, like, would Jimmy have evolved into something more funk-like? And I know he didn't want to go backwards, right? Because he didn't like playing on the chilling circuit, felt like he was playing all the same chords and everything else. But um, the James Brown shift had happened by then, and now there's a different kind of music to do. And Jimmy's not a funk guitar player necessarily, but I'd have been curious to see what his evolution would have been like as we get into a place where there is like a funkadelic, right? And you see what slide was getting to remember stan comes out in 1969 uh ride comes out in 1971 right so as sly starts going in these other directions where does jimmy go it would be fascinating to find that out but i don't think there's any way for us to have an answer for that Now, a man here saying Billy Cox is better than Noel Redding. Well, duh. I mean, I don't think there's any bold statement saying somebody's a better bass player than Noel Redding. So one thing I did was, I think I talked about this on here, but I'll do it now. Like, let me pull up Electric Lady Land's credit. Because there's something you'll find um, when you deal with a Jimi Hendrix album. And maybe it's just a later one. I know I can do it with this one. And so you'll think about, like, what are your favorite Jimi Hendrix songs, right? Like, what, what, what are your favorite Jimi Hendrix songs? So, on Electric Ladyland, I love Have You Ever Been to Electric Ladyland. Do you love Have You Ever Been to Electric Ladyland? Because I love Have You Ever Been to Electric Ladyland. Guess who plays the bass on that? Jimi Hendrix. 1983. I love 1983. It's really long and grandiose, but I love 1983. Guess who plays the bass on 1983? Jimmy Hendrix plays the bass on 1983. All Along the Watchtower. I love All Along the Watchtower. Do you love All Along the Watchtower? Pretty much everybody loves All Along the Watchtower. Right? Guess who plays the bass on All Along the Watchtower? <laughs> Jimmy Hendrix. <laughs> yeah, he also gave you Long Hot Summer Night, which is really good. In Gypsy Eyes, he played the bass on that. And on House Burning Down. Noel's a guitar player who just stood in as a bass player and resented the hell out of Jimi Hendrix. And sometimes Jimmy would just be like, nope, no, Noel, it's cool. I'll just do this myself. Nope, no, 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 no. I got it. I got it. I got it. Let me see what else we got Jimi Hendrix playing bass on. The credits on the wiki for Axe is Bold is Love. Um... It appears that Noel got to play the bass on all of those. But Jimmy, yes, did appear to tire of Noel and would just make the executive decision that he was going to be the bass player. So when you say that Billy Cox is a better bass player than Noel Redding, I mean, okay. Like, good for Billy Cox. But I can say that probably about a significant number of people. 
But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here on The Evening Jones. We do this as often as we can. My man, Lance Gilliam, handles everything behind the scenes. Thank you. Remember, if you can't catch us live, check out the podcast. Check us out. The, subscribe to the iTunes Store. Subscribe at Stitcher Radio. Check us out on SoundCloud. We are also at Google Play. I'll probably talk to you guys next week. Take it easy.